Okay, welcome to part 11 of my series looking at Russ Miller's 50 Facts versus Darwinism in the Textbooks. Um, before I start, I want to thank all of you, um, those of you who have uh, watched these videos. I'm, I'm quite surprised that any of you have, um, and pleasantly surprised. And I've loved the comments. Uh, it's been it's been uh, it's nice to know that this is appreciated. Uh, again, I'm not sure why, but I'm not gonna I'm not gonna bitch about it. Um, and what I'm gonna start doing though is instead of posting five parts at a time, I think I'm gonna post two parts at a time. Maybe try to post two parts every day uh, until I finish this up, which should be I, fairly soon. I'm uh, I'm about halfway through the video, so we'll see how that goes. Um, but maybe two, three parts, whatever I get done, um, maybe every day or every other day, whatever it is. Okay, so just expect to see these periodically. Um, and again, I've added thanks to Kenny too. Uh, I really appreciated, um, he made a comment about getting lost and trying to figure these out. And I have put links down at the bottom of the description where there's a list of all of, the, all of them I've posted so far. Um, by part number with a link to that. So hopefully that'll make it easier to, to figure out where you are. Um, I will put these into a playlist when I'm done. So, okay, I'm going to get started. He's um, he's going to show some, some he's going to show you what I think is pretty revealing information about um, his character. And I hate to tell you this, and that's, by the way, proof of an intelligent biblical creator. I actually hate to admit this now, but I'm actually going to be a world-renowned evolutionist here in about a week because I'm actually the first person to have any evidence of Darwinian change. I came up with this on my own. Really, Russ? You thought of this all on your own? I came up with this on my own. I'm just going to make me world famous. I'll probably get a million dollars a night for speaking. But I actually discovered that watermelons are 97% water and clouds are 100% water. And I thought, hey, there's a close evolutionary link here. But I thought, boy, that 3% difference is a little too much. There have to be some missing links involved. And through years of study, I discovered that jellyfish and snow cones are both 98% water. <laughs> you see where I'm going here, right? I think they started out as a lowly watermelon and branched off in their evolutionary paths into jellyfish and snow cones. And one hot summer day, the snow cone melted and evaporated into the cloud and I think we have our evolutionary tree of life. What do you think? Am I going to be a world-renowned evolutionist? So, like, seriously. Seriously, you thought of this on your own? You, this, this is your original idea. We've discovered that clouds are 100% water. Watermelons are 97%. Only 3% difference. That proves watermelons evolve from clouds. <laughs> and I discovered jellyfish are 98% water. And... So are snow cones. <laughs> that proves how they evolved. Mm -hmm. Stealing from Kent Hovind. Hasn't the guy suffered enough? I came up with this on my own. In fact, once again, Nature Magazine reported that real studies are showing there's about a 7.7% difference between chimps and man. That number will continue to, to widen as real science gets into the genome. So, Russell Sprout, you're citing the uh, Watanabe 2004 nature paper called DNA Sequence and Comparative Analysis of Chimpanzee Chromosome 22. Um, I happen to have that paper. And I decided, just for shits and giggles, that I was going to read through detail by detail, painful detail, looking for this 7.7% claim that you made, this at least 7.7% claim you make, that you quote from the paper. Um, guess what? It's not fucking in that paper. I can't, it, it, it's amazing to me. Um, if you could have, if you're going to just pick something, um, I mean, you're going to make up the 7.7% number, although I don't think you made it up. I found another creationist uh, article that had that in there. Um, but nonetheless, there's there's a whole bunch of things where they're looking at particular s short sequences where they have up to like twenty point nine percent differences. Why don't you just pull that out and say this is the new figure? Um, again, you haven't read the actual paper yourself, and I challenge you to actually read it because it's boring as fuck. Um, no no disrespect to the authors, their conclusions, their research is uh, greatly appreciated and it's truly amazing. Um, but the actual reading of a sequence, if you've ever read a sequence paper. It's it's a little painful. Um, 
But nonetheless, and while reading through it, I was actually glad I did because in when they disregard things like these indels, insertions and deletions, which account for the majority of differences, a majority of, of what you're going to discuss next, when they actually look at the that the they look at the coding proteins, the coding sequences, the, I mean the sequence of DNA that code for proteins. Guess what they found? Yeah, they're 99.29% identical sequences in the DNA that actually matters. But think about this. Talk about awesome proof of our intelligent biblical creator. The human DNA contain, think about this, 3 billion base pairs of information per cell. 3 billion base pairs of information through all the cells in your body. A 7.7% .7 difference would require 231 million beneficial information adding mutations to take place just to change a chimp into a human. And science can't show you one example between bacteria and everything on Earth. And since so many are fatal mutations, there's no way you could get 231 million of them in a row without killing the thing off anyways. Darwinism is scientifically and mathematically completely impossible. You know, as well as being completely dishonest, um, you really don't understand this material at all. Uh, you're just using words that you've taken, borrowed, whatever, um, and you don't seem to know what any of them mean. I, it's it's kind of humorous, and it's getting a little, actually, it's getting a little boring um, at this point in time. Uh, so... You're saying that 7.7% .7 of the human genome differs from a chimpanzee based on a paper that sequenced a single chromosome. One out of 23 pairs, um, first of all. That, that, that's what you're, and you're then taking that 7.7% 7 .7 7 difference, which is made up, completely pulled out of your ass, or somebody's ass, um, and extrapolating it to 3 billion base pairs of the human DNA... Do you not see how that doesn't make any sense? And furthermore, just for fun, let's pretend that your numbers are actually accurate. Okay, let's play a game of pretend. Let's pretend that in terms of actual base pair differences, there's 230 million difference, base pair differences between the entire sequenced chimpanzee genome and the entire sequenced human genome. And what does that really mean? Well, you know, 230 million positive mutations, you're, you say. The majority of those differences, the vast majority of those differences, are in non-coding regions of the genome, okay? Pseudogenes, um, these, these repeats, these indels that we were talking about earlier, um, what they call junk DNA, and I know you guys hate the term, but you, it, it's, it, it's not a very good term, I agree, but you guys hate it for a different reason. Um, the point is, is that those... 230 million are not in these positive things that make a human a human from a chimpanzee, okay? that That's where you're absolutely wrong. Um, but even if it were, so, even, even that, even ignoring that fact, um, you recognize that every single human being alive on this planet carries 1 to 200 independent, unique genetic mutations that they did not get from their parents, okay? Start adding those up. So two people, each with a hundred, a one hundred unique mutations, um, neutral mutations, uh, most likely neutral mutations, a few harmful, a few beneficial, but mostly neutral. They have a baby, so that baby has fifty from the father, fifty from the mother, God knows how many from their ancestors. So fifty and fifty plus a new hundred in the baby. So, you, you know, looking at that, when you start looking at that kind of exponential increase, it doesn't take a long time to start adding up to these hundreds of millions. Um, you know, they're, they're not as insurmountable, and especially when you know exactly where those differences lie, where, where in the genome, what portions of the DNA those are in. Remember, all point mutations at the molecular level reduce the genetic information, gene depletion. Okay, where to start with this? Um, so you're quoting Lee Spetner, um, Dr. Lee Spetner. Now, who was Dr. Lee Spetner? 
Lee, Dr. Lee Spetner was a mechanical engineer and physicist, um, now retired, um, I, I believe he's still alive, um, who got his PhD in physics in 1950. His career was in, was in the design of guided missile systems for a company in Israel. Okay, that's his professional career. And as a hobby, he wrote books criticizing Darwinian evolution. Okay, so that's his expertise. So first of all, um, I'd like to know, um, how current do you think his knowledge of, of um, mechanisms and biology and evolution actually were when he wrote those words, first of all? How current do you think they were, considering he'd, uh, well, frankly, been out of academia for 20 plus years, not academia in a completely unrelated and different field during that time period, for one. Um, but also, um, how is the words of an expert in guided missile systems and physics mean anything um, when talking about point mutations? Tell me that. Okay. And the final thing is gene depletion. There's no such fucking thing as gene depletion. I wish you would stop saying it. I think it's a word you heard some somebody say that you're just, just going to keep on repeating um, on and on and on because you think it means something. That's just one more dagger. Let me put another dagger through the heart of Darwinism. Dagger through the heart? Is that a challenge, Russ? May your blade chip and shatter. Darwinists for years have said that once we got into the study of the genome, of the human genome, we would find repressed genes of our evolutionary background proving evolution. I guess they thought we'd find repressed genes from our ape background and pig background and pumpkin background, whatever it is they think we evolved from. Straw man after straw man after straw man, Russ. You know, um, I'd like to see. I, I, I know what you're talking about. Um, what you're talking about was one of the hopes in early evolution before the discovery of DNA um, when, when, the, when Mendelian genetics were just being rediscovered again in the early parts of the 20th century. There were, there were writers, there were people who speculated, I believe Julian Huxley, I may be wrong on that, that when, when we find this code, when we find the code of life, it will have layer upon layer. There'll be no need for fossils anymore. There'll be no need for this. We'll actually be able to peel off the onion skin, the human layer, and see our Australopithecine ancestral layer. This idea sort of gained, uh, erroneously gained a little bit of popularity in the 60s and 70s as well um, with the, the, the same concept. But it's never been, at least not in, in the last 80 plus years, maybe longer, held any weight in science. It's really just a, a rehashing of uh, Haeckel's recapitulation on a genetic level. Um, which you're going to get to later on, I know. Uh, but it's nobody expected that. Nobody expected when we sequenced the human DNA that we would find, you know, this unused chimpanzee genome as well in there and this unused monkey genome underneath that. Nobody expected that. Um, it doesn't even make sense knowing what we've known about DNA for, well, decades upon decades, 50 plus years. So again, you're just making shit up. What has real science found when it got into the human genome? Well, they found that humans only have human genes. Now, you might have brown eyes and have repressed genes for green eyes, but they were human eyes. In fact, humans only have human genes. Pigs only have pig genes. Pine trees only have pine tree genes. Whales only have whale genes. This is yet one more dagger right through the heart of evolution, yet they continue to teach it in the school systems. Mind-boggling. You need a Nobel Prize um, in science. I, I, you know, it's it's amazing. Humans have human DNA. Well, holy fuck! Chimpanzees have chimpanzee genes. Pumpkins have pumpkin genes. Oh, what? This this is incredible. Um, it, it's it, it's just amazing. I I you know I don't think anybody has ever stumbled onto that fact before. Um, it's it's just incredible. What the fuck do you expect them to have? Tell me. What do you expect? What would you expect? Do you expect? I, I, I don't even know. You, you, you're just, again, you're baffling your audience, okay? You're trying to baffle them with bullshit because you don't have any actual evidence, do you?